we first got started in civic engagement, um, the Native Shoreline Buffers Project through the DNR. And they were offering to help people engage their audiences more effectively. And we knew that we were really successful with people that were 55 to 70 and fairly wealthy. And we thought that was kind of unique because we knew that wasn't all the shoreline owners. And we really wanted to know how could we be more effective with the other people? How could we do what we're doing with this group and do it with everyone else? And we were lucky enough, well, we met Carlin, I guess, right away at the kickoff meeting, but we were lucky enough to be one of two groups selected to work with Carlin Ekman and Erica Rivers and U of M Extension, and we pulled in Fish and Wildlife to employ what's called a Knowledge Attitudes and Practices study, a CAP study, which is a short study, which was one of the hardest parts was keeping this survey short, of what do people know how do they feel about things and what are they actually doing out on the lake? Or what are they likely to do? And if we really kicked around for a long time, what are the right things to ask? Because you have to ask yourself, what do I know? What do I just think I know? What do I wish I knew? What would actually really help me even though I don't wish I knew it right now? And it gets to be a long process with that many people. But we got to a really effective 20 question set. We mailed that out to almost a thousand residences in Ottertail County. Now, there, we went back and forth for a long time about whether we needed an incentive with this so people would mail them back. But when we met with, we called them in key informants while we were developing the survey, we went out to some people we already had projects with and some other people we knew on the lakes and talked to them about what would be good questions, tried our questions on them, even had them try out the survey. They felt that we didn't need an incentive, that people were pretty enthusiastic about their shoreline. And it turns out they were right. We got back over 59%. It was about 660 of the 900-some surveys. And that, I had never analyzed survey data like that before. And at first, I waited for what's the significant percentage and, and this and that. And then Carlin Ekman with the U of M Water Resources Center, she sat down with me and said, well, this is kind of how we look at these. You could take out the answers of the people who said they were about ready to naturalize their shoreline. And we could look at looking down that row of answers. What did they answer on other questions? What did they need before they could finally restore their shoreline? How did they feel about natural shorelines? How did they feel about developed shorelines? In fact, you could turn the other way and put the look at the people who said, no, I'm, I will never restore my shoreline. And you could look at, well, what are their other answers? What were their concerns with the shoreline? What were they worried about about natural shorelines? And, and that's the process where we found out that we couldn't do what we were doing and be more effective with everyone else because much of what we were doing was actually scaring people off on the other end of the spectrum by telling them they're going to have a lot more wildlife, by showing them pictures that don't have an access area in it, that just show a lot of plants and don't convey the idea of access to the lake still beyond. And their concern being access, and now they're looking at a picture and their hair is standing up a little and they're getting more and more nervous. And I'm not breaking down barriers, I'm just enhancing them. And that was really an eye-opener for us. So we went out and met with people on the lake and had a lot of meetings as a group to develop this survey, <clears throat> sent it out, got back all the answers. I had to put them all into SurveyMonkey. That probably took the longest time. All told, we would definitely do it again. We'd probably do it again with a new audience because it made us much more effective. Not only did we realize that our materials were really only working for the people that were already ready to adopt and only needed some technical assistance, but they were putting off this whole other pair of groups, the maybes and the noes as we called them. And the maybes said, maybe I would naturalize my shoreline, but they had some concerns and they needed actually a different set of outreach. They also had a different trusted group of individuals. They trusted neighbors and the Lake Association and many people who were ready to adopt trusted 
soil and waters and government and a Minnesota extension and thought that those were great sources of information. So using the CAP study and then more informant interviews after where we kind of reworked our outreach and, and went out with a bunch of our photos and said, you know, well, what, what do you like about this? And actually went to some you know, hard cases, you could call them, and said, you know, is this off-putting to you? Which of these do you least dislike? To come up with new images for all our outreach. And then kind of, we asked some questions about values, and then we realized that maybe we need some images to kind of instill Minnesotan values in there, the loon, clean blue water, children playing in the water. It just kind of set the right tone in some of our more in-depth outreach. But it really allowed us to see what we were doing from the perspective of these different groups and also to see where we could employ new resources and, and touch on maybe a bottleneck for a different group. And that would kind of allow them to move more towards the adopt range. So it really kind of lets you see the lay of the land and where you could take your resources and allow the best progression towards your goals and also where your resources might be used against yourself, where you might be turning people off instead of turning people on to your